Now we will have uh, Marvin Brown presenting on a cl climate of justice. <coughs> Jason's book, and um, some time ago, I really liked it, and it fit with a lot that I was doing. Um, and in some ways, I think uh, people here are asking similar questions to the questions I've been asking, uh, but I think I give somewhat different answers. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see uh, where I'm mistaken or where they align with each other. Um, I, years ago, got a PhD in theology and rhetoric, which some people say is the same thing. And what I was, have always been interested in is how do you create the conditions for a really good conversation <coughs> in organizations, civic conditions, etc. cetera? How do, how do you have a really good conversation where people are telling the truth? People are listening, and then people act. That kind of conversation. Um, so where I'm at now is we live in a climate of injustice. And we won't have those conversations until uh, we create a climate of justice. So a climate of injustice is an impossible context for designing a viable future. And that's where we live. There have been a couple events where, say, light has come through. Um, the one that um, is probably the most revealing is actually the Reconstruction period after the Civil War, when uh, federal troops were sent south uh, to protect freed uh, African Americans. Uh, for about eight years, the Reconstruction period, maybe nine years. Over 600 uh, African Americans were elected to office. 17 African Americans were elected to Congress. And then the troops were withdrawn, um, and white supremacists took over. That was quite a glorious time, a time of justice. Um, at the same time, uh, federal troops were massacring uh, Indians in the Indian Wars, right? So, <laughs> and it was a short time of light. Um, I had another experience, uh, similar I think. Well, no, it's not similar. Anyway, I was in the march from Selma to Montgomery, and the the day we marched into Montgomery, there were federal troops on each side of the street protecting us. So there have been occasions um, when, what I want to get to really is the protection of civilians, but when there's been occasions for something like uh, recognition of a climate of justice. So this is where the United States started, right? We started, we all know this now, the European uh, enslavement of Africans and the disempowerment and displacement and massacre of Native Americans. Uh, and in this context, our, quote, fathers uh, wrote the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Rule of Law. And at that time, laws, supported slavery, supported other things. But there was a constitution there. And in some sense, I think, um, a civilian government that we started with was better than a military government. And if you look particularly at the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement, right? What they were arguing for was the enforcement of the rule of law. So, in a sense, there is a, uh, a source of something positive in 
uh, our constitution, our government, but it's always existed, for the most part, in a climate of injustice. So how do we change? I'm like, uh, Warren, I have a plan. <laughs> so we replace the Indo-European Triadic Framework, uh, which is a very popular one. I mean, it comes out of the Christian tradition of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You see it uh, used a lot in terms of government and economy and civil society. It dominates a lot of people's thinking, and I want to replace that with a four-part framework. Um, get to that in a minute. The second thing is we have to tell the truth. Um, the principle I would use for telling the truth is if you cannot understand A without understanding B, then you cannot understand B without understanding A. So if you cannot understand African Americans without understanding white Americans, then you cannot understand white Americans without understanding African Americans. You cannot understand Africa without understanding Europe. Then anyone who does a European history that totally excludes Africa is making a mistake. Right. So I tried it in, this is a book I'm working on, um, to tell three stories. Um, one is a story of American prosperity and white compromise, and how compromises, when they wrote the Constitution of 1820 and 1850, uh, were compromises among white northern and southern men that maintained uh, the institution of slavery, and the reason they were done was for American prosperity. Um, and another story I wanted to I tell is a story of land uh, and different perceptions of land uh, in the Americas, but particularly the experience of sharecropping. Because when African Americans were freed, they had a choice. People wanted them to work for wages, and they said no. They wanted to be sharecroppers. And it didn't work out that well. But their basic premise was right, right? And a lot of people would agree with that, that in fact, we are land-based animals. And so that's kind of an opening, I think, to go back and think about how we can take out of our own history the experience of how we should relate to the land. And then thirdly, um, to create a civic space for the gathering of civilians. So there's this four-part framework, um, which I've just talked about. Um, so the earth um, is a living system. Um, we experience it. Um, I think human beings, our basic experience of the earth is breathing. <laughs> it's the first thing we do, right? And we do it until we die, and then we quit. In fact, so we're part of the biosphere, right? And that's true of all of us, right? We live in the biosphere. Um, our humanity is, um, I use it, uh, neurobiology. And what I discovered in neurobiology was an interesting sense of the self. The self is essentially a witness to the multiplicity that we live inside of us. And it's that witness and that multiplicity, witnessing that gives it purpose. And the purpose of living a human life gives us dignity. So our dignity is really contained, right, in our physicality as an animal. Other animals, primates, have the same kind of dignity, I think. The social I think this might be interesting because maybe a lot of disagreement about that. So I work a lot on whiteness and white male social systems. And I'm a white male, so I belong to that system, but there's certain parts of that system, certain parts of that world 
that I can reject. I can reject its arrogance, right? I can reject that it doesn't know any limits, and I can reject th that it has racialized humanity. Right? Uh, and so I think, I want to say, you cannot live a non-social life. We all have social positions, social locations, and we all have live in social relationships. And the civic is um, where we gather as civilians. So if you look at, uh, didn't quite come out, so there's the civic framework, what I'm calling American prosperity. I was talking to someone yesterday, they thought prosperity should be a good word. Uh, so I, I, that's okay with me. Let's call prosperity a nice word. But let's just say that American prosperity is a tragedy. Right? And people love it. And that's why it's still a tragedy. We have people coming here to be part of American prosperity, and American prosperity is destroying the earth. So that's why I use the term. So uh, the earth is treated as land. Um, this stuff is uh, obvious. Racialized humanity, um, what I call white economics, which is. Uh, even economics today, it's written by white people, it's for white people, it assumes that people of color do not exist. Whereas if you look at the real creation of wealth in the United States, right, it's by non-whites. So there's this white economics. Um, and then by private charity, I mean uh, actually the movement toward a new feudalism where you have the billionaires <laughs> The latest story was this guy, this billionaire paid the, the uh, debts of all the seniors that were graduating in the school. <laughs> Isn't that nice? <laughs> so, and we have uh, billionaires doing this and that. <coughs> San Francisco has now more billionaires than any other city in the world, right? And so nonprofits and uh, private schools and private universities are all feeling very happy. Um, and so instead of that, for a sustainable future, we need a have, uh, see the Earth as a habitat for humans and non-humans, actually, uh, a shared humanity. Uh, we, we all have the, the same humanity, except some people feel, well, some people have violated other people's humanity, right? And, so it's, it's shared in a way, but it's, it's also broken. I'll get to that in a minute. And then instead of white economics, I wrote a book called uh, Civilizing the Economy. And in that book, I talked about systems of provision, like the food system, the healthcare system, et cetera, and to organize uh, the economy in terms of systems and public justice. Uh, in that sense, I'm using the word civilian. Um, as a way of moving uh, the conversation into politics. Um, more on that. So how do we make that transition? We make it through uh, creating a climate of justice. Um, so this is one of my images of the gathering of civilians. How many of you know this? This is in Congo Park in uh, New Orleans. And, been to New Orleans like twice in the last five years. And the last time I was there, it was two years ago or a year ago, that was newly uh, instituted. It's incredible, right? <coughs> so if you know something about Congo Park, that, uh, so the French and the Spanish, uh, the colony belonged to the French and Spanish until uh, 1803. And under uh, French rule, it was possible for, um, how many? Oh, for um, um, enslaved people even to uh, have Sundays off and they would come to this park and trade and do other things. Um, so it's a beautiful uh, story of um, gathering of civilians. So who are civilians? It's taken me a, quite a long time to work on this. Um, some people would say, well, they're non-combatants, and that's true. The uh, Fourth Geneva Council uh, in 1949, 
recognize civilians as having a right um, and being distinguished from combatants. Um, I want to say the civilians are vulnerable. Uh, they cannot protect themselves. Um, they require the protection of others. And they require the rule of law. Not philanthropists. <laughs> the rule of law. Um, and we rely upon the holding of law to limit the aggression of American prosperity. And this recognition of limits, I think it's necessary for creating a climate of justice. Limits in terms of our treatment of the earth, in terms of our treatment of our own humanity, that death is pretty natural, everyone's done it so far, don't worry about it. Um, limits in terms of our the social other, that the other limits us, right? And so it's this recognition of limits on these different levels that I think allows us to move toward a um, climate of justice. And that movement um, will entail uh, collective action in terms of demanding protection, which will mean protests boycotts, other kinds of things, to try to get uh, governments to obey the law. So um, one of the ways we could do this is what I call the clash of stories. Um, how many of you have been there? So this is a stone mountain. It's the most attractive uh, tourist site in Georgia. It has the three most famous Confederate people and this is uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. How many of you have seen this? Go to it. This is a sacred place. Sorry. I was there a couple months ago. It's a memorial to the almost 5,000 African Americans who were enslaved. And so you see the clash between <laughs> the Confederate monument, right? And this is amazing, because this has been open for like 18 months. And we have possibilities today we've never had before for dealing with the conflict around slavery and also around other kinds of oppression. You all know Mount Rushmore, at least you've seen pictures of it. I was there two years ago. And eight miles away is the Crazy Horse Monument. And it'll be decades before they finish this. Um, but they're working on it. So is the gathering of civilians possible? I think the clash of stories open possibilities. Um, they expose contrasting worldviews. They expose also um, the need for repair. And I don't think we're going to get out of this without some forms of reparation. Mm -hmm. I don't know what form they'll take. That's why if we had conversations, the people who've been harmed could tell us what form they should take. I mean, we don't, I don't know. Right. Um, but um, myself, I, could, I would be open to be invited to an invitation to talk with others about how to do what needs to be done. And the problem here is one of trust. Like, why would people trust me? Right? And I think what has to be done in order to get that trust is, in fact, to share levels of vulnerability. And this happens on these different levels. This is the last one happens on these different levels. Um, the most vulnerable group of civilians are our children and grandchildren. They're vulnerable. They cannot protect themselves. They rely on us, right? So there's an intergenerational uh, connection. 
And then what I call the extended, which is like, um, remember the picture of the five-year-old boy in Syria that was in the emergency wagon? It's in my head, right? Okay, so what's our relationship with the killing of using American weapons to kill civilians in Syria? Well, our economy is based on weapons traffic, right? And so it would be totally easy to boycott the, the importation of guns in that area, and we refuse to do it. Right? We should be on the streets. We should be, that should be something, too. And on the shared level, the shared level, I think, of what's going on at the border, right? What's our responsibility of civilians and how can we join with civilians? And, and people are doing that right. And then the personal level is um, really one-on-one -on -one or in a small group uh, where we have chances, if we live in diverse communities, I mean, if you just live in white communities, you don't have those chances, but if you live in diverse communities, People actually might invite you or invite me to an interesting conversation about um, what do we do next? How do we save the planet? How do we make this city livable? Right? These are the questions. Um, I'm actually toying with the idea of trying to create what I would call circles of justice. And these would be circles where you know, people from different parts of the city, like I live in Berkeley, different parts of the city would be invited to just come and talk about moving from an unjust to a just climate and what that would look like. Right? So that's where I am right now. Thank you. <laughs>